good morning, and it's good to be in the house of the Lord again. Amen. We've been looking at what does it mean to be a Pentecostal powerhouse. And we're liking it to the person who goes to the gym every week and works out. And not just every week, but almost every day. For the true avid person who goes to the gym, it's at least a five-day-a-week thing. They're there working on their arm, arm, le arm day, leg day, back day, to get their whole body in shape. When it comes to us being Christians, the same is true in the spiritual realm. We need to become Pentecostal powerhouses. Pastor was talking about this morning making a difference in somebody's life. How do we do that? When we become powerhouses in spiritual things, when we are working on ourselves, reading our Bible, praying every day, that's when God's going to use us to reach out to somebody else. Because we have been preparing ourselves. We have been building up our spiritual muscles. We've been reading the Word of God. We've been knowing what it says. We've been memorizing verses on how to reach the laws and show them that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And when we begin work on ourselves, then we do it every single day. Daily devotions, daily Bible reading, daily um, meditation. And when I say meditation, meditating on the Word of God. And that is how we're going to become a a Pentecostal powerhouse is doing it every single day, whether we feel like it or not, because the truth of the matter is, we don't always feel like it. But what happens to the person who stops going to the gym because they don't feel like it? They're no longer going to remain the, the powerhouse that we know them to be. All that muscle is going to turn to flab and everything else. They have to stick at it. The same is true with us. If we are going to be used mightily in the things of God, if we're going to become mighty in spiritual things, that it's going to be an everyday practice, everyday routine, whether we feel like it or not. We looked at prayer, we looked at faith, and we looked at um, the armor of God. And what did it say about the armor of God? That it's mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. That is why we're trying to become Pentecostal powerhouses, because there is a real enemy out there with real attacks. I was talking to somebody, I think it was Brother Eli last night, we can have all of these satanic video games and everything else in the society that we live in, but everyone, including Christians, is practically blind to the fact that the devil is on the rampage working through these things, and that he's out there trying to seek whom he may devour. When we are becoming a Pentecostal powerhouse, that's the reason, to pull down the strongholds of the enemy. We were talking about the baptism of the Holy Ghost for the last two or three weeks. And what is the evidence that someone has received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Speaking in tongues. Is it a language that they've already known and studied before? Can it be an earthly language? It can be. Can it be a heavenly language? It absolutely can be. Is it a language that the person already knows? No, I'm being redundant. No, they do not know. It. That's the difference. If a person knows French and they're praying in English because they're American and, um, or, uh, origin, and that's where they lived all their life, even though they know the French language, if they start praying in French, that's not the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That's something that's just them praying. The baptism of the Holy Ghost is evidence in other tongues. It is not stammering lips, and what we call stammering lips is when the Holy Ghost is on somebody and all they can do is mumble. It's not English, but all they're doing is that is stammering lips. That is not the baptism of the Holy Ghost. They have not reached that point yet. Can an unsaved person speak in other tongues? If they had it at one time. Okay. If they had it at one time. Absolutely correct, brother. And why is that? Is, but what verse goes along with that at 10? Well, they can, they can speak in other tongues, you know, in any church, and it can be in every. It can be. And the reason for that is the gifts of God are without repentance, which means he doesn't take them back. No. So a sinner may speak in other tongues. Does that mean that they're saved? No. No, but God is using them. Is there any other scenarios where an unsaved person can speak in other tongues? Now, 
This person is not saved. They've never received the baptism of the Holy Ghost as we know of it, but they speak in other tongues. Is that possible? The devil has his own hand open with gifts. They're a mockery of the gifts, so they're not the true gifts of God because everything he does is a copy. The devil is not the author of creativity, only God is. When we look at everything that the devil has set up, it's a mere image of everything that God has done in the past. All the way down from the way that he uses his own gifts or mocks of them, uh, to the way he has his governmental system set up with his angels, all the way to we see the mock of the resurrection of Christ in the book of Revelation when the image is brought, quote unquote, to life. It's, or I should say, the beast is healed of the deadly wound. It's like he came back from the dead. So the devil has his own hand only here. So an unsaved person can speak in other tongues. A, if they once had the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and now they are backslid, or backslid because, because the gifts of God are without repentance, is the verse, and that's the phrasing. But when you look at that verse, it means God doesn't take back his gifts. Or an unsaved person may speak in other tongues, even though they never set foot in a church because the devil has come upon them and is using them. I remember, uh, I think either Sister Beth told me or I read it somewhere, that there was a church group that heard about this, uh, these Catholics that spoke in other tongues. And there was a missionary there who was a linguist, and they all went to check it out, and the linguist got closer to the front where the Catholics were um, praying. And as soon as she got to the front, she came right back and said, let's get out of here, they're all worshiping the devil. So the devil has his own handle on um, even the tongue itself, or speaking in other tongues, so we need to be careful. But tongues is the initial evidence <coughs> of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Has the baptism of the Holy Ghost ceased? How do we know that, brother? It dwells in us. It dwells in us, very good. I'd even go a little bit farther because the... The Baptists like to say about the, that verse that tongues have ceased. Tongues have ceased. How do we know that tongues have not ceased according to that verse? Do you remember a little bit down? The key is a little bit, a few verses past that. If tongues have ceased. It says tongues have ceased. Then, then uh, we, we as Christians would be Oh, I don't disagree. I'm just trying to get biblically on why he does it. And that it would be interpreted if it had ceased. Oh, I don't disagree with you, brother. But who's to say that we're not a whole bunch of nut jobs and, you know, that's not true. You know, what? that's not real. What does the Bible have to say about that? First Corinthians thirteen eight is the verse with about tongue seizing. I think you actually have to read down to verse ten. Verse ten tells us why tongues have not ceased. First Corinthians thirteen ten. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. So when will tongue cease? And is that perfect? Jesus. Jesus. Is he here right now? Because the uh, believe that it is not later when the New Testament was going into it. I agree, but we read last week that that's not the case. No, well, but that's the way they do. I, I know, brother. I just, we're looking at scripture, and if we trace it down through history, has tongues ceased throughout history? No. We've read how many church fathers up until about 400 A.D. that claimed that tongues was still the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And when we look at the book of Acts as a whole, has the book of Acts ceased? Has it ended? 
No, because it's the history of the church, and the history of the church is still being written. Therefore, that which is perfect has not come yet. And and if it would have ceased, Jesus would have ceased. Exactly. Well, he would be seated. Exactly, brother. And when we say exist, seated on the throne of David, physically seated on the throne of David in Jerusalem, ruling over the earth. Okay. Now we're going to move on for the sake of time. Uh, if you don't have them, there are notes back there on the communion table. And we're going to begin talking about spiritual gifts. The, and when I say spiritual gifts, more specifically, the gifts of the Spirit. When we look about, when we are looking at this, the main verse that I chose to start off with was 1 Corinthians 12, 31. 1 Corinthians 12, 11, And 1 Corinthians 10, 4. I'll read first, uh, 2 Corinthians 10.4. If someone wants to read 1 Corinthians 12.31, someone else, 1 Corinthians 12.11. They are at the top page of the notes if you have. If that's any easier for you. But 1 Corinthians 12.31. I've covered earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I, show I unto you a more excellent way. But covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet, yet show I unto you a more excellent way. What about 1 Corinthians 12, 11? Uh, but all these work with that, that one in the self same spirit, dividing to every man separately as he will. But all these work with that one in the self same spirit, dividing to every man separately as he will. 2 Corinthians 10, 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. The main passages when it comes to the studying the gifts of the Spirit are found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 all the way through chapter 14. And when we look at the Greek word translated gifts, it's actually uh, from the Greek word charisma. Why do I bring that out? I bring it out for this reason. There is a movement out there called the charismatic movement. Why are they called the charismatic movement? Because they get it from the word here for gifts. Because they are known for using the gifts of the Spirit. When we look according to Strong's Greek Dictionary, the word charisma means this. Gratitude, a divine gratitude, Deliverance from danger, passion, a spiritual endowment, religious qualification, or miraculous faculty, oh, faculty, a free gift. And when we look at the gifts of the Spirit, that's exactly what they are. They are a free gift from God. What is the prerequis uh, prerequisite or the requirement for receiving the gifts of the Spirit? Okay, be saved is one. That's a very good one, brother. I, I didn't go back that far. So be saved. And what's number two? Baptize the Holy Spirit. Baptism of the Holy Ghost. A person can have dreams and visions when they're saved. They can hear the voice of God when they're saved. But they cannot be used in the gifts of the Spirit unless they have first been baptized with the baptism of the Holy Ghost with evidence in other tongues. So I'm going to rattle our brains a little bit. So how many gifts are there? There are nine gifts of the Spirit. And what kind of gifts are these? If we're going to choose between fleshly or spiritual. Spiritual. They're spiritual. If I'm going to come and if the Holy Ghost was going to give you the gift of discernment of spirits, he's not going to come and hand you a Bible or something physical or give you some type of meter that you can put out there and read, you know, saying, oh, pinpoint on this is what demon it is, yada, yada, yada. They're spiritual. It's the Holy Ghost working through us. It is a gift that God has given us, but the Holy Ghost is the one who teaches us how to use it, and he is the one that guides and directs us. So it is a spiritual gift. And when we look at the baptism of the Holy Ghost and the gifts, is there a distinction between the two? Well, 
But yes, Brother Justin, there is a distinction. So what is that distinction? The distinction is this. The baptism of the Holy Ghost is for every believer. Every person who has received Jesus Christ as a personal Savior, stop doing uh, those wicked things, turn from the wicked ways, ask for forgiveness, they can receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Well, Philip, uh, what did Philip 8 tell you about this? Which one is it, brother? 1 Corinthians 12, 8. 8. Yes, sir. We're getting there. I'm just building up to it because we're not going to get into detail. So the Holy baptism of the Holy Ghost is different and separate from the gifts of the Spirit. However, while everyone may receive every may receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and the baptism of the Holy Ghost with evidence is for everybody, not everybody is used in all nine gifts of the Spirit. Because the Bible is clear, the Holy Ghost told us, that he is the one that divides to every man severally, several gifts, however he chooses. And he didn't say all the gifts, but he said several of them. But then some can have all. Some can have all. I won't disagree with that, brother. And I'd like to believe, and I don't see any evidence contrary, because of course it's up to God and the Holy Ghost. And when I say God and the Holy Ghost, there are one, but the Holy Ghost. If no one else wants to be used in this gift, I don't see any reason why we can't seek for that gift. Seek for the gifts that the Holy Ghost has given us. Seek for him to reveal to us those gifts. But God desires to have all the gifts work in operation. And when we look at the church as a whole, as a whole, if the gifts are in operation in the church, which gifts do we typically see? Tongues is one of them. An interpretation. We, we can have the word of wisdom and we can have the word of knowledge. I won't say that. They're a little bit harder to decipher because we may not always know when they're in operation. Because sometimes something might hit the pastor, Sunday school teacher, you know, and it just comes flying out and they can be there like, whoa, where did that come from? But no one else really picked up on it. So it's possible. That, that one's not picked up, and I won't not deny that that one's not being used. But if we had come to interpretation, what's the other known one that we have? Uh, Prophecy. Do we ever see any other of the gifts in operation? We might see healing once in a while. But, and when I say healing, we got to keep in mind that there is a distinction between the gifts of healing and healing in general. Because the Bible talks about that if one is sick, call for the elders of the church and have them lay hands on them. Does it say that the elders of the church must have the gift of healing? No. It just says, come and pray for them. The Bible says, lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Who is that commandment to? Everyone. Yeah. Does that mean that everyone's going to have the gift of healing? No. But God is bound by his word. And if he said it and we do it, then he is bound by his word. Does not mean that we have the gift of healing. We might, but that doesn't mean that we do. And miracles. Working of miracles. When was the last time that we seen the working of miracles in the church? And I don't mean here, I just mean as a whole. We all the time. You might see it all the time, but we gotta keep in mind there's a difference once again between miracles and the gift of the working of miracles. Just like um, when we start talking about the baptism of the Holy Ghost, what's one thing that we began getting confused with the evidence of tongues? We began getting the gift of tongues mixed in there. Are they two separate things? Absolutely. There are two separate things. Because the person who receives the baptism of the Holy Ghost, they're to speak in tongues. And to be honest, they ought to be speaking in tongues every day when they're praying. But is the evidence of tongues, or the person who is praying in tongues, is that the same as the gift of tongues? No, they're two separate things. If we're not careful, we can get them blended together and mixed up. But in reality, they're two completely different things. When it comes down to the person who is praying in tongues, who's that for? For that person. It's for that person. But if a person is in a church service, 
and gives tongues forth, who's that for? That's for everybody. So there's a distinction. Everybody can pray in tongues that has the baptism of the Holy Ghost, but not everybody that has the baptism of the Holy Ghost has the gift of tongues. They're distinct. They're separate. Does that make any sense? I mean, if we're not careful, we can blur things together, but that still doesn't make them the same thing. They're still separate. They're still complete. So just because we might see somebody heal because we laid our hands on them and prayed for them, doesn't mean we have the gift of healing. It just means that God is bound by his word. But there is such a thing as the gift of healing. And even when we look at um, how there are gifts, and it's a free gift. Let me back up. I don't, I don't even want to go there. But we've already said that there are how many gifts of the Spirit? There are nine gifts of the Spirit. And when we look at these nine gifts, they're actually broken down into three different categories. There is the revelate. There are the revelation gifts, the power gifts, and the inspiration gifts. The gifts that we see most of the time in operation in the churches are the inspiration gifts, the tongues, the interpretation, and prophecy. Those three are the three that we normally see go forth. There are such a thing as the revelation gifts that we've already mentioned to you this morning. Are they in operation in the church and we don't know? No, quite possible. But they are the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, and the discernment of spirits. And then finally we have the power gifts as they're known. The gifts of faith, the gift of healing, and the working of miracles. And of course they're known as the power gifts because they're the ones that we see that go forth with power from the Holy Ghost and display it. Because power, even Jesus said that virtue left him when the woman uh, with the issue of blood touched him. There's power in there. So, Someone who gets completely healed, arm grows back, you know, or their muscles grow back, or somebody who wasn't able to walk before is now walking. You know, that's a power gift because there was a demonstration. Power went forth. And when we look at the gifts and the number that there are, there are nine gifts and three categories. And when I say categories, Keep in mind, who decided the categories for the revelation gifts, the power gifts, and the inspiration? Who gave them that title? Where do those titles come from? I just want to throw that out there. Do we see the Word of God classifying them as three different categories? When we look at the three categories, the revelation gifts, the power gifts, and the inspiration gifts, man is the one that divided them into those three categories. When we look at the Word of God, the Word of God informs us that there's nine gifts. They don't, it doesn't give us any categorization, category gate. <laughs> it doesn't break them down into those categories. We broke them down into those categories. Other men have broken them down into those categories to try better understand them. But when we look at numbers in the Bible, and Sister Beth loves numbers in the Bible, I'm being sarcastic. She hates numerology and symbolism and all that other stuff. But we can see the gifts being the number nine, and if we do uh, Bible numerology, it would be three times three. That's how we would get nine. When we look at the number three, three is the number of the Godhead. But when we look at that number nine, Nine is the number of completion, of spiritual, of divine completion. Completeness in general, fullness, and finality. Some of the examples we get are the fact that there are nine gifts of the Spirit. There are nine fruits of the Spirit. Now, if we go a little bit farther and look at the purpose of the gifts in general, If we go back to Ephesians chapter 4 and 11, if someone would please read Ephesians 4 and 11.
And if you want to hold that passage, and then I'll have you read verses 12 and 13 here in a second. Well, I'll just go ahead and read the whole passage. Ephesians chapter 4, 11 through 13. He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, that we all come in the unity of, of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So the Word of God instructs us in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, that he gave gifts to the church. He gave gifts. And he named those gifts. Apostles, prophets, teachers, and so forth. And what was the reason that he gave these gifts, Brother Peterman, in verses 12 and 13, if I may ask you to read those again. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying, edifying of the body of Christ, that we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. I believe that these reasons line up with the gifts of the Spirit as well for the purpose of God giving us the gifts. Because when we look at the gifts, what are, why does he give us the, the gifts? For the perfecting of saints. If there's a tongue interpretation, sometimes... There's sin in the camp, and he's again right. I remember years and years ago, you know, somebody telling me that Joel Olstein's dad, when he was still alive, was on the platform. And he fell over onto the ground, holding his chest. They thought he was having a heart attack. And all of a sudden, he started prophesying, there's sin in the camp. Well, Joel Olstein and his mom shushed it down, but what was going on? God was trying to get a hold of people. For the perfecting of the saints. For the edifying of the body of Christ. When tongues and interpretation or prophecy goes forth in this church, what's it typically for? For the perfecting of the saints. For the edifying of the body of Christ. How many times do we hear that we are to, uh, that if we draw nigh to God, we'll draw nigh to us. Or if somebody's going through this in tongues and interpretation, that if it, we'll just find ourselves in a place of prayer, that God will be there for us. Or if we lean on Him, He will surround us and protect us. What is that? For the perfecting of the, for the edifying of the saints. What does Mark chapter 16 and verse 15 through 18 state? Mark 16, 15 through 18. Someone has first current uh, Mark sixteen, fifteen through eighteen. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. And these yeah, and these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, they shall not hurt them. They shall lay their hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So the other reason we see is for the work of the ministry. We also find that in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 1 through 5. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined to know and not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of men, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So why would the gifts of the, of the Spirit be given to the church? For the work of the ministry. Even when it came to the Apostle Paul here in verse 4, what did he say? I didn't come with you enticing words. I didn't come to debate. 
But how did he come? In the demonstration of the Spirit. What is the demonstration of the Spirit? The working of the gifts of the Spirit. The working of miracles. The proof that what Paul had was not just another religion, but he had the real thing. If we go back to the revival there at Samaria in Acts chapter 9, I believe it is, we find the sorcerer there, he wanted to buy what they had. What did they have? They had the baptism of the Holy Ghost, but I'm sure they also had the gifts of the Spirit in operation. And he thought that was something he could buy. It's for the work of the ministry. And it's for the edifying of the body of Christ. If I, I'll go ahead and read 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And there are several verses here we'll look at. 1 Corinthians 14, taking us back to one of the chapters dealing with the gifts of the Spirit. And though I bestow all my good to feed the poor, and though I give my body to bur be burned and have not charity, whoop, I'm in the wrong chapter. But he that prophesied, prophesied speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifies himself. But he that prophesied, guess who he edified? He edified the church. Verse 12. Even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. And finally in verse 26. How is it then, brethren, when ye come together, every one of you hath a psalm and hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation? Let all things be done unto what? What's that, brother? It does, but the word here in this passage says, unto edify. And who is it edifying? The church. So the purpose of the gifts of the Spirit, and we've discussed some of them, are for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. We will conclude and finish up next week. Does anybody have any thoughts, any questions, anything that they would like to add? If not, let's bow our heads and prepare our hearts for service. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and shall continue to do. Lord, we thank you that your God who reigns with high that there's none like you, Lord. Even right now, we rebuke every attack of the enemy that should come our way. We pray that you set your angels at the four corners of the property, above and below, that no attack of the enemy may penetrate. I pray that our hearts and our minds will be in one mindset and one accord, that we may worship you in sincerity and truth, that the Holy Ghost may move as you so desire. I pray, Lord, that you would anoint our minds and our hearts, that they be plowed, that they be good soil on. Lord, that we may be in unity, Lord. That we may take to my, remember the things that the pastor has for, uh, spoken to us, that like you have spoken to us today, Lord. That we may remember throughout the week, Lord, but even greater than that, that it would take root in our hearts, that we may apply it to our lives, that we may be transformed into your very image even more. And knowing the pastor's mind and his lips, as he brings forth your word today, give him a special blessing, Lord. And knowing the song leaders and the musicians, as they lead us in the songs you have us to sing, give them a special blessing as well. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.